Hello, and welcome back to the Creamsicle Chronicle podcast. My name is JT Olson. With me, returning to not only the show, but the United States, is Garrett Ballard. Garrett, this is true. I'm doing well, man. I was on a bit of a vacation hiatus, whatever you want to call it, to uh, uh, Europe uh, before that, and uh, Georgia before that, and then Europe. But uh, back now, ready to uh, hit the ground running. We got training camp coming up, so uh, I'm excited. Yeah, you really did pick the best time to be a world traveler. This yep. football dead season is just a wasteland of boredom and suckitude, especially if you're a baseball fan and you're like the Tigers. Yeah, uh, I am. I do have the Rays game on right now in the background. Uh, they're currently winning, um, which is always nice to see. Um, very thankful Being that the Rays have Esau Paredes. <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, as we say frequently, this is a Buccaneers podcast. Uh, we have some news that we want to get to. Uh, probably won't be the longest episode today just because there's not a ton going on. Um, but it is what it is. We can only do what we're given. Uh, talk about what we're given. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, some news that I think a lot of people were expecting us to talk about. And some news, uh, not really news, but just a, a training camp preview. Yeah, and let's jump into that news. Yeah. The big news... The Buccaneers have a new tight end. Kyle Rudolph, former Viking. I think he was with the Giants for a second. Yep. He's joining he Tampa Bay. So, Garrett, what are your initial thoughts on Kyle Rudolph? Let's just jump right into it. Yeah. Um, do you want do you want just the player or just the signing as a whole? Because I could do um, either right now. What do you think? Let's start with just the player for now. Okay. Um, I think at this point in his career, uh, he's pretty um, – average at best i want to say i mean he'll make an impact in our tight end room because of how uh kind of inexperienced and shallow it is but uh i don't think this is going to be a guy that's going to come in and uh fill the void left by rob gronkowski in his retirement uh this is a pretty much just a stopgap i want to say until they can get um someone better in there I think he'll suffice as a receiver um I think they're going to put him at in line I don't know how well it's going to go because I don't think he's been the best blocker in his career uh but we are going to see I think this is probably the best option that was out there so yeah I talked a little bit about Kyle Rudolph a few weeks ago maybe even a few months ago now it feels like it's been a while but he was probably my top, if the Bucks were to sign a free agent tight end, Kyle Rudolph was kind of the top guy. Hmm. It's just kind of a jack of all trades. He can catch it some, he can block some. He's not really great at anything, but he's okay at many things. And I don't think this is a groundbreaking signing. I don't think it's earth shattering. I think he can come in and potentially help the Bucks, especially with K. Otten having been injured and kind of doing rehab and not really up to full strength yet. You, know, you can take some pressure off Kate Otten as a rookie. But tight end, yeah, he's an okay tight end too. He's not a good a pass catcher as Cam Bray, but he might be a better, better of a blocker. Yeah, I think that's really why they brought him in. I think they're going to use, I think we're going to see a lot more Coquif or however you say his last name than people really expect uh, because of how proficient he is as a blocker. Uh, I know there are a lot of people who were saying he was the best blocking tight end in the draft. Um, and Gronk was really the only guy who could block any last year on the team. Like, they put O.J. Howard there, but he was, man, like there was, there was nothing to write home about there. So I think they really wanted to get a solid blocking tight end that they could put out there. Um, and the best one on the roster might be the rookie. Uh, Rudolph, they'll put in line, like I said, but it'll be um, – up and down. I don't think it'll be anything too crazy. Uh, but I really do think this is just a, like you said, kind of like a bridge to Kate Otten kind of becoming what they hope. Garrett, I don't want to alarm you, but you may have just stepped into a Bucks Twitter bear trap. Oh, no. So while you were traveling, Co-Keefe has become quite the talking point among Bucks Twitter. So... I write all these rookie profiles for Bucks Report. Mm. Coke Heaft 
was by far my most viewed profile. He got three times as many views as Rashad White or Luke Gadecki. The people are talking about Kokeeft, and he is divisive. There are legitimate Kokeeft trooper, uh, truthers who love him and love the grit and toughness who, that he's going to bring. And there is an anti Kokeeft crowd who think he's not going to make the roster. He's a practice squad dude. And it has become shockingly divisive for a six-round pick. You may have missed all this while you were traveling. Yeah, I think I did. That's kind of insane. Um, don't stress yourself so out about that. That's just not something that's worth it. I mean, if he does <laughs> make the roster and ends up blocking a lot, cool. If he doesn't, oh, well. I don't think it's the end of the world. Like, I mean, I just said that I think he's a good blocker, and we could be seeing a bit more of him than we thought. I don't think this is a stud player. Like, he's a – a blocking tight end that can't do anything else like <laughs> being honest here and then if you hate Kokeeft, cool i don't really care <laughs> you, that's your prerogative i mean i think he's more likely to be bad than good that's for sure uh but yeah that's that's really funny i missed that <laughs> yeah i was really surprised by it you know yeah he sent me the numbers on like the articles that have been doing <laughs> you know, views, and it's just like, what, what, what's Kokeef doing there? Yeah, yeah, I did not think much of it when I was writing the report. That's funny. <laughs> so let me just ask you flat out. Do you think Kokeef makes this roster as a yeah, fourth put on now? Yeah, I do. You do? How do you envision his usage? Is he going to uh, be regular? Purely blocking. Or... Purely blocking. Um, nothing else but blocking. I think they're going to bring him in in jumbo sets if they ever do that. Uh, whenever they need a pure like blocking tight end, uh, if Coke keeps on the field, you better you're they're probably running the ball. But you know, um, but uh, uh, I was doing some roster research the other day. Uh, last year they carried. Um, oh, let me pull it up one second. I think it was either four or five tight ends. Um, I'm trying to remember. Here we go. They. Carried. Let's see. They carried Gronk, OJ Howard, Brait, uh, Cody McElroy, and JJ Howland, I think. So they had five. Um, I would, those guys were not in the roster the whole year, though. They were just kind of in and out those last two, weren't they? Right. And I think that will be Co Keefe this year. I think they're going to have uh, Brait, Otten, um, Rudolph, one of them, Keith. Probably McElroy, and then Keith. That's what I think. See, I think Keith has a legitimate pathway to playing time as a special teams guy. As he cannot, a he's, he can't move. I I don't see it. I don't think he can run. <laughs> can he run as well as Pat O'Connor? Uh Probably like he, not. He doesn't honest. have to be like an immaculate athlete. I mean, we I have don't think he's. Teams. I think he's like a bad athlete. Like, um, I think Pat O'Connor is a better athlete. I mean, not to show throw shade at Pat O'Connor, but he is not the fleetest of foot. He's like two hundred and seventy pounds. No, of course not. Um, okay, so he's definitely for than I thought. He ran a four eight five. Respectable. It's respectable. Um, yeah, that's, that's fine. For a guy, what was he? Two sixty. Uh, how big are you? Uh, yeah, two sixty. And then Pat O'Connor ran a four eight nine. So they're very comparable athletes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Pat O'Connor is a good special teams player. Yeah, he is. Uh, so he, he, I mean, Kokeef won't be the gunner, you know, first guy down there on punt returns. He's not no, taking not. Grant Stewart's place on this team, but I think he can <laughs> contribute on special teams. Oh, I, I think we're both. I think he makes the roster. I think we're both in agreement here. Yeah, he has value. He's a niche player, but I really like his niche. Yeah, I, I will say, if you're a Kokeef truther, temper your expectations because you're probably not going to see him much more on much if it's not special team. Are just pure blocking sets. The only thing that makes me anti Kokeeft is he may is, eliminate the Vita Via fullback. Um, I don't think so. 
I don't think you can. I mean, it's you put a tight end back there who's slow for his position, blocking, probably has never had the ball in his hands. <laughs> That's a lot, right? but like, um, like a bit of a fabrication. He definitely has, but very few times recently over a guy who has probably similar offensive touches who is <laughs> – 350 pounds on a goal line package. If they opt for Co Keith over Vita Vea, I will be sad. I will be too. But you really want to put Vita Vea on that position unless it's like a must have touchdown, like a playoff. No, yeah, I know. I, I don't, I definitely don't like Vita Vea being out there frequently because he's like our best defensive lineman. But um, it's fun, that's for sure. Let me tell you the dream. Yeah. Backfield, Tom Brady, followed by Vita Vea. Followed by Co Keeft, followed by Leonard Fournette. Just full house of beef. It needs to be 260 pound Lenny though. Oh, I hope so. There is no <laughs> other there is no other Lenny right now. Uh, quarter pound or large Lenny. I am for it. <laughs> oh man, that's funny. He he'll be back down to weight. I I'd, I'd be shocked if he's not, but that was a very funny moment in time. 260 pound Lenny. I don't even. I think that's from the original story, like a month ago, is what I read. Yeah, I know. Me too. So for the people great. out there thinking Leonard Fournette's showing up to camp completely out of shape, not the case. Yeah, don't by expect all that. Because if he would starters, it'd be a terrible look for him, and then second, he'd get crazy fines. The team would find him a lot. So uh, I think I've seen videos of him working out with guys like DeAndre Swift, Jamar yeah, Chase. You know, have. Some, Younger guys, but good athletes. I mean, yeah, we we know what Lenny can do. Like, I, I have full faith in Lenny. Uh, I don't think he'll be irresponsible and squander uh, this opportunity, given that we have him for another three years, right? Uh, yep. So um, I think he'll do his due diligence, do what he needs to do, uh, stay in shape. Um, oh, it'll be fine. Well, let's use that as kind of like a transition, as kind of one of the initial training camp stories. I know a lot of people have been talking about Leonard Fournette. I think that's a lot of smoke, much to do about nothing. But there are some interesting storylines to be watching going into training camp. So let me ask you, what about training camp are you most looking forward to seeing? Like, what's your biggest thing you want to see this year? Uh I don't know if it's like the most important or the biggest, but something that I'm going to re really be keeping my eye on is uh, the wide receiver battle for like the, the last couple spots in the receiver room. Um, obviously, there's guys like Scotty Miller, Jalen Darden, Tyler Johnson, uh, Jaden Mickens. Uh, right, Mickens, or was it – am I thinking of someone else? I think Mickens got cut. Mickens? Uh, Cyril Grayson, that's who I'm thinking Cyril of. Cyril Grayson. Um, Rashad Perryman. Yeah, I think Perriman's a lock, to be honest. I don't think he's going anywhere. Um, you think Perriman's think, that fourth guy? Yeah, I do. Uh, I think it'll be Evans, Godwin, Gage, Perriman, and then I think it'll be Darden, Miller, Grayson, and I think Johnson is going to be that guy that's um, on the bubble. So you think they're keeping seven? I think they're keeping – I want to say they're keeping eight. I think that eighth slot is uh, the uh, – they kept eight through the majority of last year, um, especially with all the injuries and the Antonio Brown-isms that happened. Um, uh, so I think they're keeping eight. I think they're going to go into the season with eight, and I think it's going to be between uh, Tyler Johnson and some of these other uh, – like the camp names that they've brought in and signed um, – because Tyler Johnson ended the season very poorly last year. He did not inspire me uh, with much hope. Um, it'd be, I think it'd be tough if he doesn't come out swinging uh, to not find a guy who could do his job more consistently than him at this point. Yeah, and they brought in a lot of undrafted free agent receivers, so they want to create that competition for guys like Jalen Darden and Tyler Johnson, who I think is right now kind of the guy who's got his head on the chopping block. He's got the most to prove, even even though I think Darden didn't really show anything last year. Last year was his rookie year. He gets a year of adjustment. He brings special team value that Tyler Johnson doesn't really bring. 
So I think right now he's on the outside looking in possibly with all of these names and another team could cut more veteran wide receiver who brings value as well. So there's competition in camp and I think there's going to be competition on the free agent market for a guy like Tyler Johnson. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, I'm just kind of looking at how the season ended last year with all the wide receiver turnover we had. Um, You had Rashad Perriman carved out a really nice role with the team. Uh, Cyril Grayson found a really good role in that Panthers or was the Jets and Panthers game. I think both of them. Yeah. He had a nice little run there for a minute. Yeah. Yeah. The right at the end of the season. Um, And then you have guys who have made huge plays for this team and Scotty Miller and Tyler Johnson uh, not do much. And I think Scotty Miller is going to get the benefit of the doubt because he's done it longer and a bit more consistently than Johnson. But last season was not good for either of them. Uh, and they need need to show some stuff to, uh, I, I feel like, stay on this roster. Here's what I'll say about Scott Johnson. Miller. But Scotty, I think, is fine. Yeah, I think he's shown more than a lot of people give him credit for because he did end the year a little bit on a sour note. I think he showed well in that Rams game. But before the Bucks initially signed Antonio Brown two years ago, I think – Scotty Miller was the Bucks' leading receiver through six or seven weeks. He was having a really strong year for a wide receiver four. So yeah, I he was think great. the coaching staff does trust trust him. It seems like 100%. Todd Bowles and Brian, Byron Leftwich speak more highly of him than Bruce Arians did. And you can tell he's just not Bruce Arians' mold of player. You know, he's fast, which I know we all love, but he's not that gritty kind of dude that Bruce Arians wanted him to be. We can take a fast, effective wide receiver as a depth guy. That's just fine with me, and I think he's comfortably on this roster right now. Yeah, I agree. I, sh- I think I worded worded my words. My, f- oh my gosh, that was a crazy thing to say. I phrased my words poorly. I should say. I I, f- I think he's completely safe on this roster. I just think he, the way he ended the year, um, he might not be later on into the year if it, if it keeps going on. But like you said, I think that the coaching staff trusts him. I think Tom Brady trusts him a lot, uh, given what we saw that Super Bowl season. Uh, he had made so many clutch catches. Um, I don't think there's any, like, uh, there should be no shock when Scotty Miller makes the roster. Um, but uh, I think he'll be one of the, the last names, uh, the, the, the lower names on the depth chart. Yeah, and I think... I think it's an interesting battle between Perriman and Miller because they both bring that big speed element. The one thing I'll say about Perriman, even though he's been kind of a journeyman through his career, he got cut by the Lions last year, who were not a good team, did not have a good wide receiver room. Perriman is not just fast, but he's also a pretty good blocker. So I think he's going to bring value to a team who I think is going to prioritize the run game a little bit more this year as Tom Brady turns 45 and they beef up their O-line a little bit. I think that's going to be valued that much more this season. I agree. Uh, I Like I said, I think he'll be the wide receiver four. I think he'll be the first guy on the field when the guy comes off. Um, I think if Chris Godwin misses games, he'll be that three for us. Because uh, I do think, like you said, he's a bit more of a complete receiver than any of the other guys behind him. Uh, he has the experience. We saw Brady and him uh, get some good chemistry going at the end of the season. Uh Again, it'll be kind of just like following it through training camp because um, there's really nothing settled on this wide receiver chart aside from the top three guys, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we know Mike Evans is a stud. Chris Godwin's a stud. Russell Gage is going to be a really valuable player for us. And then there are guys who, you know, there are things you like about them, but they all have warts. Yeah, I agree. It'll be it'll be very, very fun to watch, though. Um what about you? That was a long conversation about the wide receivers. Uh, that was my topic. You got anything on your mind that you, uh, you're you going to be paying attention to? Well, I mean, you know me. I like to stick in the trenches. That's where my attention is first and foremost. So I'm going to be watching this three-way brawl for the left guard job between Luke Gedeke, Aaron Stinney, and uh, Robert Haynes. Do you I say think Robert it's a I think it's a competition. I think it's going to be a really interesting battle between Stinney and Gedeke because Stinneke's probably the favorite going in. Did I say Stinneke? You did. <laughs> Stinney's probably the favorite going in because the coaches know him. They trust him. He started in the Super Bowl, so he's got some 
some cachet within that locker room already. But I think eventually Gedeke going to win this job. And I'm really excited to watch him transition from not only a smaller school in Central Michigan, even though it's an elite football program, but he's moving from tackle to guard, which is also a transition. So I think the progression he makes is going to be really interesting. And just kind of watching these three players, I'm going to be kind of paying attention to every rep, especially with the defensive line talent they're going to be going against. You know, Vita Vea, Akeem Hicks. I'm really anxious mm-hmm. to see what – forgot our, fir- our first round pick's name. Uh, Logan Hall. Sure. Logan Hall? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, Logan Hall. He wasn't a first round, but top of the All second. Right. Essentially, yeah. yeah. 30 pick, 33. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he's going to be going against those guys. And that's going to be really interesting to me and kind of who who gets that early edge and who eventually wins that job. Yeah, I personally, I kind of agree with you to an extent. I think uh, Stinney's going to be the, the favored one originally just because of uh, Gadecki's uh, inexperience and adjustment time. But I think by the time the regular season rolls around, Gadecki will have the job locked up. I, I feel like the, that's what the coaching staff wants. I feel like that's the way they're really going to push it. Um, I feel pretty confident that they're going to they're going to give him the starting job pretty early on. Do you think Robert Hainsey has a strong chance in this? Because he came from a no. much bigger college in Notre Dame, and he's had a year in the system to kind of develop and improve his skills and kind of become that guy. In theory, he should be that next man up. He should be next in the pecking order, but it feels like he's the third man in this lineup. Yeah, in theory, you're right. Uh, I just feel like they were grooming him to be a center and take over for Ryan Jensen. And then when Jensen came back, he kind of got lost in the shuffle when they drafted uh, uh, Gadecki and re-signed Jensen. Um, I think he's easily, I mean, I shouldn't say easily, but I think he's the third guy out of these three. And it really makes me question his long-term future because we know the Bucks have traditionally cross-trained their interior offensive linemen. So based on what the Bucks have always reportedly done, he should be able to play either guard position, you know, even though he was kind of projected as center. But if a year of experience coming from a bigger school and he's still kind of that other guy in the room, it makes me wonder even if he had opportunity to play at like center. You- how much value does he really bring there has there? been there has been zero i mean no there's been no talk about him since we drafted him like it's almost like he's done nothing right like there's been mm-hmm. nothing no news you don't, no you nothing. don't expect to hear a lot from an inactive offensive lineman but you want to hear something like man robert right, hainsey is but, really putting in the work he's a he's a glass eater he's you know he's a dude in this room but at the same time he's an inactive offensive lineman who we drafted in the third round who is still not making any waves like it's the Kyle Trask argument why is this guy not the backup or at this point for Hainsey the starter because there's an open job and they already drafted a guy to take it you know who I've heard more buzz about than Hainsey who that big Hutchinson guard from South Carolina we took like two years ago yeah he's he's like yeah, I think he's good, and he was hurt all last year. I like him a lot. He's a bully. Dude is tough. I really yeah, like you hear Darius a lot more about him and just his nastiness yeah. and his strength. And and then our third-round pick is just like a ghost town. There, yeah. I think Sidarius Hutchinson, Hutchinson makes the roster. I think he was kind of like stashed on the practice squad, got hurt. Um, I think he he's one of the – the backup depth offensive line. I don't think he'll still see the field a ton, if any, but uh, I think he'll be on the 53. I think if he does, it's both an an endorsement of him because he does have talent. He is strong. Yeah. He's a powerful yeah. guard, and this, that'll fit really well with what the Bucks do. He was a little raw coming out, but if he makes that, that team, it says he's developed. It also yeah. says that maybe some of these other dudes didn't develop like we wanted them to. Yeah. So I'm just looking at this, uh, by the way, I, I'm, uh, writing for Ux report. Now, um, you can find some of my stuff there. Uh, I put out an article just like previewing the positions going into training camp. So I'm going to list out these names, right? Interior offensive line. Tell me which ones you think make the roster. Okay. Okay. 
Ryan Jensen, Shaq yep. Mason, yep, Luke Gadecki, yes, Robert Hainsey, yes, Aaron Stinney, yes, Curtis Blackwell. I couldn't tell you anything about Curtis Blackwell, so no. Gary. Uh, Garrett, we may have lost some connection here. Nope, the internet has never heard of Curtis Blackwell either, so Garrett has officially crashed. He has beaten the internet. But I think to Garrett's point, there are a lot of names in this interior offensive line group. Zedarius Hutchinson is a guy we took out of South Carolina a few years ago, and, and Garrett's back, so he can continue telling me about some of these other names. I am back. I lost yeah, you at Blackwell. weather going over our head, so. Blackwell, okay, so there's Curtis Blackwell, Sedarius Hutcherson, Nick Leverett, and then John Mulchon. Mul, Mul, I don't know how to say his last name. Um, I'll cut that last guy because I don't know anything about him, but I do know, I've heard buzz about Leverett. It seems like some there's some voices who who like Lever. I think he's he's another guy kind of like Hutcherson who's kind of earned some cachet, has kind of worked his way up a little bit. It's just with it's Gedeke between the two Hainsey, though, right? Like it's between those two. That's, that. Yeah, it feels yeah. like only one, if if one, only one of those two guys is going to make it. Right. Exactly. It's one of those two. I feel like because I don't think Blackwell or Moltron are going to really do anything. I think those other two are younger. I know. I think Nick Leffert was on roster last year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I believe he was, if not practice squad. Right. Uh, so I do feel like uh, one of them makes it because we had uh, some guys leave and we brought in a rookie. I feel like they might try and stick one more uh, guy there rather than somewhere else. I don't know. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think those were – him and Hutcherson were both brought in as like developmental guys with really a nice set of tools, you know, powerful, move well for their size, considering yeah. those were some, you know, hey, there's something here you can develop. It's raw, but it can be developed in a year or two. Here yeah. we are a year or two later. Now we might see some some real players here. Yeah, I definitely, I, I feel like that's what it is. I mean, Hutcherson's super strong. Uh, I don't know a ton about Leverett, but uh, uh, that's what I would assume as well. Like, I don't think they're putting uh, these uh, this uh, these resources into guys who can't do anything. Um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I feel like that's accurate. I th think uh, it'll be – if they take an extra one, it'll be one of them. It's just the big if right now. Yeah. Yeah, I liked Hutcherson a little bit. I I thought he'd be drafted the year he came out. Yeah, you know, he does have power. He does have that bully mentality. It'll be interesting. He'll be he's for like the pure football junkie third string guard kind of people out there. He'll be a name. I think a lot of for people follow. Sure. For sure. Okay, uh, that's good. What else? What other positional battles? Oh. Secondary, specifically nickel corner. Uh, I think Carlton Davis, Jamel Dean got the outside corners locked up. I think Antoine Winfield and then Keanu Neal got the uh, free and strong safety spots locked up. But I'm really looking at Logan Ryan and Sean Murphy Bunting. Uh, Murphy Bunting has really not made me happy the last two years. I think he's been pretty bad, to be honest. Uh, and they brought in this guy to compete with him, uh, ideally take those nickel rolls. So I just, I'm, I'm eager to see who wins it. Yeah. And I think we both lean in the same direction on who is going to win it, but I'm not going to say it because I'm incredibly biased when it comes to Sean Murphy bunting. I'm rooting for him. I'm not going to hide say it. it. Logan Ryan him. will win it. <laughs> I, Logan, I want Logan Hall to fail, not because he's bad, but because Sean Logan Murphy Ryan. bunting takes that job. Not Logan Hall, Logan Ryan, please. Or Logan, Logan yes. Hall, you cannot fail. <laughs> Logan Hall is going to be great. Yeah. Logan but, Ryan um, is going to also be great, but he's not going to win that job because Sean Murphy Bunting is going to be better. I mean, I think it's going to be situation. I think they're both going to get reps. Uh, I just think Logan Ryan will get more. He has the experience. I know the Bucks have liked him forever. Uh, they wanted him when he was a free agent three years ago, I think. 
Um, uh, so we know they really like him. And I kind of, I don't know if I'm just, this is a complete guess. This is complete just uh, prediction. I feel like Murphy Bunting might have be, might be falling out of favor a little bit with the, with the defensive coaching staff. Um, he's not been good. There's, that hurts I my mean, heart, Gary. That, that, that I know, makes- but it's the truth. You know, it's the truth too, though. Like, I don't, I, I'm choosing not to to believe that. Uh, I'm, I only remember the three games from the playoffs. That's those are my only Sean Murphy bunting memories from the Super Bowl run where we have picks. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I remember him but, picking off Aaron Rodgers. I remember him picking. I off will. I will minutes. note for the for the audio listeners um, when I said, "You know, he's bad." JT did nod his head slightly. So <laughs> that's that's blasphemous. I would not. <laughs> did I? Did it I is really on that? recording. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> Damn you, subconscious! Why are you gonna wrap me out like that? <laughs> no, he Sean Murphy Bunting has absolutely had his share of struggles, and you know me, a proud CMU alumni, Sean Murphy Bunting, a proud CMU alumni. You know, I have a very big bias when it comes to him, but if I'm being completely analytical and honest about it, I do think Logan Ryan will win that job. Yeah. The only concern I have is going to be a little bit of a war of attrition because Logan Ryan is a little bit older. I think he's 33. He's been in the league yeah. for a while. Yeah, you talked about him. experience, and yeah. he definitely has years. Yeah, he, we have we only signed him to a one year deal, obviously. So um, I would imagine if Logan Ryan does win that job, that they'll look for a nickel corner pretty early in the draft next year or aggressively in free agency. Um, I also want to say I'm if the Bucks had brought in an outside corner to compete with Jamel Dean, I'd be saying the same thing because I am also not sold on him fully. Um, the only corner I'm really sold on is Carlton Davis. I think he's really good. Grabby, but he's good. Um, just he's catch the damn ball. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, I just – it'll be interesting. I'm looking forward to it. One name you didn't mention in this big secondary conversation, Mike Edwards. I mean, we brought in Keanu Neal for that more box safety. Antoine Winfield, yeah. obviously, a pro bowler. Mike Edwards led the team in interceptions last year as a guy who only started, I think, four games out of kind of necessity with injury. Are you kind of envisioning a larger role for him, even though the Bucks brought in two outside safeties this year? And kind of how do you see his usage kind of developing over camp? I wish he would be in a large role. I just kind of see it the same way. I feel like they're going to bring him in every now and then in games, and he's going to make impactful plays, and they're not going to change anything about it. I love Mike Edwards. I think that guy's a stud. Uh, you're right. I totally forgot to mention him. That's my bad. Um, but kind of like coming into the season or like coming into the off season, I was like, just put Mike Edwards at nickel. I was like, I don't need any. Just put him there instead of Murphy Bunning or just – put him on the field. He just needs to be on the field. Dude's a playmaker. Like there's no two ways about it. Like uh, you can't like whenever he's on the field, he's making impactful plays. I mean, I don't know why he isn't on the field more. It doesn't make a ton of sense to me because I think all he does is just prove that he should be out there. Yeah. I mean, he's our best range safety or over the top guy. I mean, you talk on the sideline ball hawk. There's no one better than Mike Edwards on this team. And yeah. we know that he's had his leadership raved about because I, there's a, a draft story that's gone around about Mike Edwards since he was drafted. And that's, you know, the Bucks went to Kentucky's Pro Day and they interviewed all the players and they said, if you could bring one guy with you to the NFL, who would you bring? And, you know, a lot of people would have assumed it would have been Josh Allen, who was going to be a top 10 pick that year. Everyone said Mike Edwards. Mike Edwards is that dude. He's that guy I want to bring with me into the battle. So we know he seems like a really strong locker room, you know, kind of guy, and he's got talent. It is a little puzzling why we haven't seen him more. And it might just be an abundance of talent with Jordan Whitehead being a playmaker in the box and Anton Winfield being a talented young safety. Maybe we see a little more Edwards and Winfield and kind of Keanu O'Neill is kind of more a specialist, maybe a short yardage, maybe I would love that. box guy. Maybe maybe Winfield and Edwards both take some rep at nickel. I would like that a lot. I think that would be the perfect recipe. I 
don't know what their plan is, but that would be mine. <laughs> yeah, it'll be interesting to see the usage of all of these guys through camp, especially with Todd Bowles kind of moving to a different role, although kind of keeping the same role, different voices with different defensive coordinators. You know, we really have three defensive coordinators this year in a way. So yeah, kind of. <laughs> we'll see how that all meshes. Yeah, it'll be interesting for sure. Um, anything else you want to touch on? What are your expectations for Logan Hall this year? I know he hasn't signed his contract, but I expect him to be in camp. Yeah, we brought in yeah. Hicks to compete with him, Will Golston. I mean, it's a good defensive line group, and there's high expectations for him. I think what people should expect is what we saw of Joe Tryon Schenke last year with JPP kind of uh, spelling him or him spelling JPP. Um, favor the, the vet and the rookie comes in in certain situations. I expect him to be increasingly impactful as the season progresses. Uh, and then by the end of the year, I think people will be ready to say, give Logan Hall the full-time job. He'll be good at it. Is this Will Golston's final year of his contract? Because I think he kind of projects to that position more than the three. He definitely does. Uh, I think he can play a little think, bit of both. But I think we saw him. him. Wait. Did we extend Wait, when did we... Golston? When did we – okay, we signed him to a one-year deal this offseason. So that could be the case. They, instead of have him on for Hicks, it's Golston because he definitely does project to that bit of a um, three-tech rather than the, the big 340-pound Akeem Hicks role. Uh, that just – that makes uh, – man, I don't – that's weird because who – uh, never mind. They'll bring Nunez Rochez on for Hicks, yeah? Probably. I will say Jason Light has done a brilliant job in bringing rookies in slowly and having them learn from a veteran, whether mm -hmm. it's Mike Evans learning, learning from Vincent Jackson or you know Devin White learning from Levante David. You know, There's always that established veteran in the room when you draft a rookie to replace him eventually. Joe Tryon Chewinka with JPP. There's yeah. always that transition plan. You know, no pressure right away on that young guy. Learn, this is how it's done, and then thrive in year two. And it really feels like that's kind of the expectation for Hall this year. I mean, I think it should be. I don't think uh, with how good our D-line is and has been, uh, I wouldn't expect them to feel the need to rush someone in there. You know, I feel like they're like, we got a really good unit. Let's just let him grow into the what he needs to be. And we have the people and coaches and players around him that will help him do that just in due time. Yeah, I really want to see him, his development this training camp. You know, because he is a player who I wasn't super high on coming in, but he has athletic ability. He does have talent. It's just about polishing it. And when you're learning from... You know, if he's a different mold of player, but you can use, you know, a keen Hicks and learn a lot of hand usage and, you know, because he's really yeah, good. I mean, if you're coming in and playing with the keen Hicks and not taking something out of it, you messed up because mm -hmm. that guy's gross and has been for a long time. Um, same thing. I mean, same thing with the edge rushers. Like if you're going to be a, a smaller defense, interior defensive lineman, learn some quick like quick moves from learn some speed to power, just stuff like that. You know, take nitpick from the people around you. Just just learn and apply what works best with your game to your game uh, to develop like that. And I don't know what people are going to – my mind just goes back to Vita Vea's rookie year, and everyone's like, oh, this guy sucks, but he didn't play in training camp. So the first six weeks of the season were like his training camp and then his preseason – um just give him time like there's no need to rush him into being a superstar like we drafted him in the second round uh ended up getting us k dot and zion mccollum two people that i think are going to be pretty important role players for us this year uh 
just give him time, and I think he'll be good. I think it's, it's like I said, a lot like the, the JTS situation last year. Zion McCollum, another name I'm excited to watch this year. Uh, you talked about potentially replacing Dean next year. Zion McCollum is that guy, a year of development, could step in and be that guy. So his progression is what I'm going to watch too. Yeah, he could be really good. I, I'm, if there's a corner that went on day three, that could be really good. It's Zion McCollum. Let me quickly touch on one last training camp battle. I think it's flown under the radar a little bit. Okay. Ryan Suckup versus Jose, was it Borealis? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, I don't remember his last I think Suckup has so. it. Suckup you think he's going to get it? Yeah. Dude's been fine. Like I, he has, He's done nothing to make me be like, oh, yeah, I think he can go. I think fine is a very lukewarm word. I mean, fine is good. You like fine. You know, 40 yards out, you're like, yeah, we got this. This, this is fine. You know, 45, it's like, okay, this is probably all right. This, this, this is fine. This is fine. Get to 50 yards, and it's like, oh, I don't know about this. That's correct. But also, if we are copping out and taking 50-yard field goals as frequently as we did this year, I'm going to be kind of upset. Uh, I think last year we left a lot of points on the field because we opted to go for field goals where we were in a situation that we should have gone for the first down or something greater. Um, I think they're just going to go with the, the, the experienced hand who's uh, been there and they know can get the job done if their offense can get them down the field, which nine out of ten times it should do. So... Do you know a lot about Jose Borgales? I know I know he's a Florida no. guy. I think he went to Miami. No, he went to Miami. That's all I know. And I, and I know he was on the practice squad last year. I'm looking him up right now. So he was a actually really accomplished college kicker. He was a Lou Garza award winner in 2020. Yeah, yeah, I know he was really good at Miami. So, I mean, I don't know how much stock you can put into college kicking awards, but – you, you know, in theory, the he's Burrow supposed to be Wild. The Burrow <laughs> Wild won that Don't, award. That that name is not welcome on this show. How we and how Borg Alice are gold oh, oh, winners. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But yeah, I think Suckup's going to get it. Yeah, I think I think it'll be interesting because, and I. I mean, interesting in a way that kicking training camp battles are interesting, not like interesting, interesting. But they didn't yeah. bring in a rookie punter. So do you really want two rookies, essentially, as your specialists? Definitely not. Maybe not, but we'll see. We will see in due time. Okay. I think any other thing from training camp, or does that about wrap us up with that portion? I think that wraps us up. All right, let me throw one last thing at you before we get out of here. And this is non-Bucks related, so the diehard Bucks people, you can tune out if you choose. <laughs> but Kyler Murray got paid yesterday. I think it was, was it five years, 46 Four. million a year or something like that? It was, oh, yeah, it was five, uh, 46 a year. Yeah, that's correct. I think uh, it makes him the that's... second highest paid quarterback in the league. Only behind Aaron Rodgers. Um, what are your thoughts on that bag that was just dropped on Kyler Murray? He, he has not shown me enough to for me to say he is worth it yet. Like I think he's an electric player, and I think you do have to sign him long term if you're the Cardinals. But um, dude, like he runs the Cliff Kingsbury offense is not the greatest. I think Kyler Murray the middle of the field very well um or at least hasn't uh which worries me um and i just i i don't i think he's fine like i don't know man like i don't think he's the guy that's gonna like he i think he needs a pretty decent team around him i don't think he can will a team anymore i mean 46 is a lot man it's a lot for that's a team. lot that's, that's a lot, a lot for, for anybody. Like that's a, I Mahomes making that fine. Rogers making Mahomes, Rogers, 
Josh Allen, Tom Brady are the only four quarterbacks I would give that money to right now. What does Tom Brady make? 25? So Kyler Murray is basically cheap. two Tom Brady's right now? Yeah, yeah, cheap. Brady, We have Brady for cheap. That's why, that's why we're able to get so many good players. Yeah, and it's a steal. I know Kyler Murray was hurt till the, towards the end of last year, but they went like on a five-game skid to end the year, and it looks like he just did not want to be in the playoffs in Arizona. Yeah, and he's just... always got kind of a butt face about him, but he looked like he was just disinterested. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think he put the Cardinals in a pretty crappy situation with all that because um, if you're the Cardinals, you invested a number one overall pick into him. Uh, he took you, uh, like, he gave you good seasons. He's very talented. We all know this. Um, and he, you want, want to extend him, but <laughs> he's not going to take anything less than the second highest paid quarterback in the league. Like, that's really, that stinks, man. Like, that's tough. Um, this is like Steve Keim, I think, as soon as he put pen to paper on this thing, was – realizing this this could be his job if it doesn't work out. I don't know how much Steve Kime realizes because I think he's a terrible GM. I'm I shocked think you're right. he's bad. I think you definitely can't realize much, but um, he could have been fired. Shocked three years years fired. Ago. Yeah, he's not good. He's not good. Let me ask you two questions to wrap up this Kyler Murray conversation. Yep. Is Kyler Murray a top 10 quarterback? Yeah. Number two, how much taller is his stack of money than Kyler Murray? That's a really good question. Like, I think a bag of money, (laughs) because you see it in the the movies, you know, $100 million is like a suitcase. But if I stack those up, you know, that could be four feet tall. Is that reasonably, you know, a little bit taller than Kyler Murray? How, I think, I mean, $100 million cash that's more than a suitcase for sure. See, I have no real concept of it because I don't really have a lot of money. But I either picture well, it okay, in a suitcase. I was picturing like a briefcase, a suitcase. Um, Should I picture like the big pile of money the Joker gets in Batman? They lights on fire. I don't. It's taller than Kyler Murray. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I don't know the dimensions, but it's taller than Kyler Murray. To have a pile of money taller than me. That's the dream. If only, man. <laughs> Good for Kyler. We're, we're super yeah. happy for Kyler Murray. Hey, man. Show. We have no issue with players getting paid that much money. We have an issue with the uh, reasoning behind it. Get your money, though. I'm all for it. Man, I don't think the Cardinals are, are going to be good. I really don't. No, I don't think so either. I don't think so either. I think I'm going to go make um, myself money and bet the under on the Cardinals a win total this year? I don't know what it is. That's a good question. Uh, but I if think it's that is... Than six, I'm betting the under. Yeah, I think that is going to wrap us up for tonight, um, today, this morning, whenever you're listening to this. Uh, we appreciate y'all coming out and listening again. We are happy to be back recording. Uh, we will be back weekly episodes unless something goes horribly wrong like this week. We both had technical issues. Back-to-back nights. It was brutal. <laughs> and, um, uh, yeah, that's tough. But uh, check us both out on uh, Bucks Report, writing some stuff for the Bucks. Uh, check me out on Twitter at NFL Ballard, JT at Icewater Olson. Um, is there an underscore in there? I can't remember. Nope, just Icewater Olson. Nope. Icewater Olson. Uh, Bucks stuff, me, Rays, JT Tigers, me, Lightning, JT, Red Wings, of course. Um, Red Wings. It's going to be the <laughs> next Detroit team to win a championship. Probably, honestly. Uh, the guys the good ball thing. He likes the Pistons. I don't have an NBA team because the Magic are the Magic, and I have no affiliation with them at all. Um, you want to get in I, on the Pistons with him? It's going to be an exciting couple of years. I don't enjoy watching basketball, I won't lie. Uh, so I cannot. Um, but, yeah, that'll wrap us up for tonight. Thanks for coming out, y'all. Thanks for listening. Uh, see you all next time. Go Bucks. Go Bucks.